Hi, thanks for having me here today. Um, this is my first time speaking at DjangoCon, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, basically, I'm here because there came a point in my Django learning curve where you know, I, I built some applications, I'd done some basics, or done some stuff with it, and now it, I felt like it was time to monetize those applications. Like, how do you accept credit cards? And this, this kind of uh, scared me a little bit because there's a lot of responsibility that comes with this. You have to take care of people's data and be responsible with it. You have to follow certain regulations. And there's a lot of choices and a lot of terminology out there. So um, through this talk, I was hoping to just pass on kind of what I've picked up through that, um, through, through my experience of doing that a little bit. Um, and I'll be talking about various payment gateways, and um, I have no affiliation with any of these gateways, just, just as a disclaimer, but uh, um, this whole topic interests me, so um, let's go from here. Um, some things I want to talk about today. Um, first of all, how payments work. Um, I want to give some Django code examples for, for some basic payment things. I want to talk about different payment gateways, um, go through a feature comparison through some of those gateways, and then go through some uh, general tips and considerations when building uh, applications that require payment. And as far as my, my focus, it will be mostly on server-to-server -server technology. So what is a payment gateway? And basically, it's a gateway between uh, you, the merchant slash developer, and the banks that process your credit cards. It, it's um, similar to a point of sale device, such as a credit card swiper, um, but obviously a web version of that. And some examples are the ones we're going to talk about today, Authorize.net, PayPal, or PayFlow, Stripe, and Braintree. Um, so for some basic terms, um, First of all, um, a merchant account is something that will come up in this talk. And a merchant account basically is a, a bank account held by a merchant. And um, it requires like a, a subscription. And it, it's a little bit more than a bank account because it, you can connect uh, other types of payment devices to it, like um, a credit card swiper would connect to a merchant account. Or that's how uh, merchants accept money, basically. And so there are two parts to a payment. Um, typically our online payment, there's the authorization step and there's the settlement or the, the capture step. And the authorization step, say you're a, um, a customer coming to a website, uh, you fill out, um, you submit your credit card information, it goes through the payment gateway and the merchant um, you know, submits an authorization request like to the banking network basically saying, um, I want to authorize this amount of money that this customer gave me uh, I want to make sure they have it in their account and, and uh, be ready to accept that amount. Um, so it takes, basically puts a hold on that amount for a certain period of time. Um, it depends on the bank as to how long that hold will be for. I think it's usually a few weeks. Um, even if it's not, the next step would be the settlement step. And if it's not settled, uh, that, um, that money would just go back into the customer's bank account. So the settlement step is um, where tr money actually changes banks, bank accounts, and uh, you know, money from the customer's account goes to the uh, merchant's account. Uh, a note about um, online, uh, if you're shipping physical products through online, um, uh, as an online merchant, you can't, you can't do a capture until you've actually shipped. Um, and another thing, uh, a bit of terminology, refunds are different depending on what phase you're in. If you've, uh, if you're before, if you've done a capture, then you would uh, issue a credit. If you haven't done a capture yet, you'd, you'd void the transaction. And that's important because the APIs have different calls for those types of actions. So here's a basic um, diagram of, of the process. It's, uh, it's kind of what I described. A customer goes through a merchant which um, goes through a payment gateway, and then uh, that goes into the, the money cloud, uh, the AHC network. And uh, um, the blue line here, if you, could, if you can see on the diagram, the blue line indicates what happens during an authorization, and the green line indicates uh, what, happens during a, uh, uh, what happens during a settlement. So that's kind of how the steps break down visually. 
Now, I'm not going to talk about this too in depth because I found out there's another talk about it, but uh, uh, PCI DSS is an important uh, topic. It's basically regulations you have to follow when you're, um, process or when you're, any when you're touching credit cards in order to keep them secure and, and uh, keep, your, um, keep your customer data safe. And just briefly, I'm going to touch through the different components. Um, first of all, you need to have a secure network on your, on your system. You need to change, or at a firewall, you need to change the defaults. Uh, you need to protect card holder data, um, basically um, encrypt your data or uh, through SSL and such. You need to manage your vulnerabilities, you need to keep your software up to date, and develop secure applications. You want to develop strong access control. Um, you want to ensure that every user who has access to that data has a unique ID so it can be audited. You want to do regular monitoring and testing, and uh, you want to keep an information security policy. So uh, this chart I found particularly interesting. Um, the, uh, it kind of tells how the different credit card data, different credit card components can be stored. And for example, the primary account number or your credit card number, uh, you look at this chart and it uh, indicates you can store it, but you have to encrypt it. Whereas the CVV value, uh, you can't store it, um, and it has to be a transient piece of data submitted and then disappeared. Uh, a little bit about the credit card number. Um, there's uh, the first, first digits of the credit card number help indicate the type. So for example, Visa is four, MasterCard is five. And this is useful for building a usable interface for your, your customers. Um, you can have uh, it auto detect, like uh, a good example is Grubhub. Um, if you type in a, a credit card number starting with a four, it auto highlights the uh, the Visa or a five, it auto highlights the MasterCard. So it's, it's something to consider to, um, uh, to help you make it more comfortable for your users. There are um, a bunch of standard um, test credit card numbers that you can use. And these, if you want to you test your gateway, for example, uh, you'll want to have to pass credit card numbers through it and actually have the gateway respond back and, you know, uh, give a test successful response so you can build your application around that. And this is a list of some of the test credit cards that are um, often used. And the one I typically use is the, the one with four followed by ones, uh, the Visa, and it's um, just useful for that kind of testing. Each credit card um, passes has to pass a LUN check. And this is basically a checksum algorithm to ensure that uh, the data is typed in correctly. It's, um, this is a Python example I found and, uh, and use. And this is often helpful for adding to your form as like a validator. So if uh, you can help detect errors in a, in a person's typing in the credit card field really quickly uh, and report back to the user before even submitting that information to the payment gateway. Now, uh, I'd like to take a look at a basic Django checkout example. And here's a, a basic Django view. And it's nothing too fancy, but uh, a few things I want to point out. First of all, if you notice the first line there where it's uh, grabbing the order, I go order equals dot, dot, dot. That's kind of indicating I might pull that from the session or um, from my shopping cart. And then I'm doing a. Uh, a regular post. This is just this is not a class-based view, but it's just a regular view. And um, one thing that's interesting is that um, uh, I'm storing the a copy of the post data into a new variable, and then uh, blanking out the post data. And I've done this because um, a lot of times, when um, if if there's an error somewhere in your checkout view, it will raise an exception and either e email it to you or um, uh, or report noisily on the screen. And this is obviously a bad thing in order to keep, keep your application PCI compliant. You don't want an email with all of your customers' posted credit card information going into some inboxes, even if it's your administrators. It's, it's not a good thing. So this kind of um, fakes it so you can um, hide that, or so it won't be in the post data. Uh, there's also a, uh, a few decorators that came out and new versions of Django, I think one's called uh, sensitive variables and sensitive post variables, or sensitive post parameters, 
which uh, will do something similar to um, this. It will basically obscure those uh, pieces of data, but this is just the, the method I've used in, up until the new version. Uh, then if you see down below, we're just doing a form is valid, and after the is valid, it's making a call to the credit card processor, and I'm just, um, I defined a method on my form uh, to do the credit card processing, and, um, but that's, it's up to you how you want to design that. If it's successful, you can save your order, you can e send out an email, a confirmation email, and then redirect the user to a, a thank you page. If it fails, then you, um, you would redisplay the form. Here's a basic checkout form. It just has the, the basic Django fields for credit card information. And then I, as you saw on the last slide, I define a process transaction. And, and the reason why I like to add the process transaction method to the form where it does the API call is because um, you can add like error messages from the gateway, the payment gateway into your form. Uh, so it will show up in, in kind of in your form's error message list which is just kind of handy for being consistent. Um, but uh, uh, here in the process method I've defined, it's just like a, a generic method for, for what I, I would actually be doing to interact with the gateway. Uh, here's a, a, a Django uh, credit card form field, and this is from, uh, uh, from I can't read that, Django or Python uh, credit card fields project. It's a nice little project that has some of these predefined, and uh, it's basically doing um, some uh, validation, and uh, and then it's also running that uh, uh, that LUN check as the last step there. So that's where I'm calling it here. So you just it's normalizing the data, validating, and then calling the LUN check just to do some basic data, and then I can mix this into the, the forms. And same thing here with a CVV field. It's just doing some regular expressions to validate. Uh, nothing too special, but it's handy to have these so you don't have to keep re retyping and recreating these valid this validation all the time. Now I'd like to go over a basic uh, payment gateway overview, and um, the ones I'm going to talk about today are Authorize.net, uh, Python PayFlow Pro, Stripe, and Braintree. And a lot of these credit cards have some typical services that they use, like that are, that they come bundled with them. And um, a lot of them have basic credit card processing, uh, recur like you know, just submitting a, an API call to, to uh, make a call, to charge a card. Um, recurring billing, so you can have monthly or weekly schedules. Um, they, you can store credit cards on their server and, and have them tokenized, so you can have varying amounts at varying times that you can charge the customers, like uh, for like a if you have a gas bill or something, if you're building an app for a gas bill or something. Uh, and also a lot of them will have some uh, address verification system which is uses the address provided in the post data to uh, validate that the credit card is um, valid. Authorize.net is uh, the first um, payment gateway that I like to take a look at and it's basically one of the internet's biggest gateways. It's been around for a while. It's, um, it connects to a merchant account, um, and it's a, it's a very traditional thing that's been around. A lot of big companies use it. Uh, here's a, an example of their, um, their dashboard. It's just, a, uh, just to give you an idea, it's a pretty fully featured uh, dashboard, and uh, um, you know, get you, I like that. So. Authorize.net has a bunch of uh, Python tools that support it. Um, the ones that I've had experience with are Quick.Pay and PyAuthorize, and both support the AIM product. And um, AIM is just what they call their, or they call it advanced integration method, but that just means that you can do server-to-server -server credit card transactions. Uh, and it supports um, Sale, which doesn't authorize and capture in one, does authorize, capture, void, and credit, so you have the basics. Uh, these, as far as I could tell, these uh, particular modules don't support recurring billing or stored credit cards, but um, uh, some other options I've so seen out there um, do. There's Django, Django Busar, which seems to, or may do recurring billing, and uh, Authorize, which may support uh, SIM, which is stored credit cards. I haven't had a chance to test those two, but um, if you're looking for 
if you're looking to do recurring billing with these solutions, then uh, you might take a look at those. Uh, here's a, uh, a code example of uh, authorized.net authorized call. And I'm using uh, quick pay here. And um, basically, you can see you define a credit card object, which has the credit card information. And then um, you create a payment gateway call and um, specify your, um, your login credentials that are provided by authorized.net. You, you set the test variables, and then you, you uh, submit a sale passing in the credit card, and you can interrogate the results uh, pretty easily with, uh, um, as a Python object. And it's nice, it's very, you know, it's very simple. If instead of doing a, a sale, you can do an authorize or, or a, um, a settlement or a, a, a capture uh, call. And, um, you know, it's as, as easy as that. Uh, you can't really see this, but it'll be posted on the slide, or oh, I can post the slides. These are some links to where you can find some more information, some, like where you can create a test account for authorized.net and uh, where you can find um, non-Python documentation. And unfortunately, authorized.net does not support Python natively. They, third parties do that. And just to get an idea of pricing, uh, authorized.net is $99 for a setup fee. It's got a $20 monthly rate. Um, it's got a 10 cent per transaction fee, and then if you want to do recurring billing, it's $10 per month additional and $20 a month for storing credit card information. And then uh, pay PayPal. Um, PayPal has um, kind of a, they have like two services that are very similar, and this is a point of confusion. There's one called um, Python PayFlow Pro and one called um, uh, Python Payments Pro, or PayPal Payments Pro, sorry. Up. PayPal Pro, PayFlow Pro and PayPal Payments Flow Pro. And uh, um, you can see how they are confusing to even say. Uh, one, the difference is um, uh, PayPal Payments Pro, uh, you, uh, they have a merchant account that they, they act as the merchant account for you. You have to use them and they store your money and um, uh, where PayFlow Pro uh, you can supply your own merchant accounts, um, so it gives you more flexibility. But uh, PayFlow Pro is more expensive as a result. Um, the uh, uh, also there's uh, some some things I've read online about um, Payments Pro is that they'll hold a reserve, like a certain percent. If you're in a risky business, they'll hold a percentage of your money um, for a rolling reserve for a certain period of time. So. Uh, um, you might not have that available all at once. Um, that's, that's been one complaint I've heard about that. But they need to do that because if they're storing your money, um, if, if there's any chargebacks, um, they need to be able to fund that chargeback. Um, today I would like to talk mostly about um, PayFlow Pro, which is the one where you bring your own, uh, bring your own merchant account. And Python PayFlow Pro is one of the modules that I've used. And it, it's a pretty, pretty good module. It supports uh, the basic operations of sale, authorize, capture, and void, and credit. Also, it does recurring billing, and it does uh, reference transactions. And reference transactions is basically um, how you can do stored credit card information. Um, the, it, you, you, submit, you basically submit a transaction once, and then you get a reference ID back. And then in the future, you can use that same transaction ID to um, uh, to charge the card again for a different amount. And so here's uh, Pay PayPal's dashboard. It's, a, it's a pretty clean, even though um, they have this way of doing um, virtualization, or like at least like little virtual websites that uh, can be take a little getting used to. And I think they do that because uh, if you're using the PayPal buttons, uh, you need to somehow emulate your customer's experience. Uh, the uh, the pricing for PayFlow Pro is uh, is two hundred and ninety five or two hundred and forty nine dollars for a setup fee, uh, a sixty dollar monthly charge, ten cents per transaction, and if you want recurring billing, it's another thirty dollars um, with some additional fees if you want to pay other services. Um, the PayFlow Payments uh, PayPal Payments Pro is a little cheaper uh, because again, as I mentioned, uh, you're using their their um, merchant account. So um, 
if we take a look at Braintree, um, this is like a fairly new option. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard of it. It's um, a lot of the big Web 2.0 two, web 2 companies seem to be using it. Um, and um, their, their dashboard is, is very you know, slick and, and uh, very Web 2.0 ish itself. And the nice thing about this is um, it's, uh, it has supported Python, or it has Python support built in. They cater to Python developers and other developers, but they're, they have a really good um, documentation for Python. And uh, you can just pip install Braintree, which is their module. And you can't see it here, but there's the GitHub link. Um, the documentation has a lot of Python examples, and it's uh, just overall pretty easy to use. And it supports um, all of, uh, like the Python module supports all of uh, Braintree's basic functionalities. Here's just a very simple sale example. And um, uh, here you're creating a configuration object. You're um, creating a, a sale, which you're passing in credit card information. And uh, you get a result back. Um, you can see. Um, you can take a look at the credit card. Or you, you, the result gives you back an ID um, that you can interrogate. And um, the difference here is um, uh, the sale. Um, the sale operation just does an authorize, whereas you have to submit a um, submit for uh, settlement in order to do the actual capture or settlement. So it's a two-step process. You can pass the sale function, um, different parameters, so it does both at once, but by default, this is how it works a little bit differently than the sale on the other APIs. Uh, Braintree uh, is about 30 bucks a month. The rates vary differently based on the type of card, um, and the rates are based on a percentage plus a, uh, um, plus a flat rate per, per transaction. And then you're paying extra, $20 extra for uh, password vault or uh, credit card vault, which is where you store your credit cards, and uh, per monthly one cent charge per credit card for that, and then recurring billing is also 10, 10 cents per subscription. So, um, there, so there, it's a fairly complicated pricing model, but um, you know, Stripe is um, a, a newer option, and it's it's another development. Uh, centric or developer centric option, and its motto is written by developers for developers. Um, it's very Python friendly, Pythonic API, good Python docs. Um, the difference here is that there's no merchant account. Uh, the money is sent directly to your, your checking account. On the downside, um, uh, on the downside, you have to wait about seven days for um, the uh, your money to be submitted into your checking account, um, and um, that's. Uh, Again, f for them, for, as a safeguard for them, instead of uh, if there are chargebacks. And a chargeback is basically when a customer purchases something and set, holds onto it and says, uh, says to their credit card company, uh, I didn't buy this, and um, costs have to be eaten in that case. So um, anyway, Stripe, um, uh, Stripe has this uh, JavaScript library that you can use. Uh, it's called stripe.js, which is kind of nice because you can just put that on your page and um, it will submit your credit card information or you can create a form for it. It will submit your credit card information without ever having, having, without having to have that information ever touch your server, uh, which is nice if, you're, uh, if you want to be PCI compliant. It just, over JavaScript, it sends that information to the, um, to the Stripe API. It gives you back a token, which you then use uh, to process the tra transaction on your server side. Um, of course, the downside of that is you have to have um, JavaScript enabled for that to happen. Um, oh, here. The, uh, um, uh, but you, can, you, don't have to, you don't have to use stripe.js. You can do it all on the server. Stripe has a fa fairly nice um, dashboard. One neat thing about it is you can easily switch between the test and, and live site. And uh, if you see that uh, switch on the top left, um, it lets you quickly switch back and forth between them. Um, Stripe is a, a pip installable package, and um, documentation is available online. 
as I said before. Here's a quick um, example of the API. And basically, um, that first line, or that first, um, where it's creating this token, that's what that stripe.js would do normally, but here's how you do it on the server if you, um, if you didn't want to use stripe.js. You're just creating a token which has a credit card, which has credit card information, and then it goes, does an API call to uh, the Stripe servers. It gets you that token information, and then you use that token in your, your charge to create, um, to actually charge the card. Um, so it's making two API requests, and then you can get back, you get the charge back, and you can do stuff with your charge ID. Uh, you can register for a test account. Um, again, the, um, it's pretty easy to get set up, and the documentation is here. I'll, um, we can post this, I'll post it on the slides, you will see that better. Stripe has really uh, the simplest um, pricing model. Um, zero setup fee, zero monthly cost. Um, there's a per transaction charge. It's a little bit higher than some of the others, and um, it includes the vault, includes the recurring payment, uh, it, it's char they charge you $15 per chargeback if, um, if you have a chargeback. And so I, be I believe, you know, this may be um, a cheaper option if you're um, getting started. You, don't, you pay on a per-transaction basis. Um, over the long run, I, th I believe you'll probably, if you're, if you're a high-volume customer, you'll probably, uh, um, that's where the difference is. Um, you probably have to pay a little bit more than some of the other options. Uh, so just doing a basic gateway feature comparison, um, kind of summarizing and comparing side by side what we just talked about. Um, first party support, PayPal has none, authorized.net has none, Stripe and Braintree both have uh, supported modules. Uh, recurring payment, um, they all support one level or another of recurring payment and they all call it something slightly different, uh, which is confusing. but. Um, it's, uh, I guess, how they differentiate themselves. Uh, stored credit card information, they all support it on at one level or another also, also calling it with different names. Um, they have varying degrees of international support. Um, Braintree has um, some international support. It supports US and Canada, and they're working for more. Stripe, um, their international support is in progress, but currently, uh, supports just uh, US. Uh, some general payment coding tips and considerations uh, I wanted to cover. First of all, uh, one trouble when you're, one problem you have sometimes in a uh, credit card account or a checkout view is if a customer is on your checkout page and they submit, uh, they click uh, the checkout button twice, it has a potential to mess things up and send uh, two requests if they're done in uh, rapid succession. So one just user interface trick to help prevent that kind of thing from happening is um, disabling the submit button the first time you click it with JavaScript. And obviously this, isn't a, um, this is only a, uh, a JavaScript solution, so um, uh, it's not ideal, but it will probably help in most of your cases where that might be an issue. Uh, I like to keep the authorized capture process or the sale process outside of the, the form clean. Uh, I don't like having um, an API request going on every time someone validates the form. Um, I th I th my opinion, it should be uh, clean first and then, <coughs> and then process the transaction. Um, because of the PCI compliance, um, it's important to me to, or I, I find it important to submit the credit card information as the last step, so you're never storing that credit card information. Um, though that that diagram from earlier indicates that you can store credit card information if you encrypt it. I, I think it's just a bad idea, um, be, especially since there are services that do it for you and, um, and you have none of the risk of storing credit cards. Um, one thing to be careful of is if you're implementing a shopping cart application and you have uh, multiple screens uh, and you're storing your credit card, or like the user's credit card submitted information um, between screens, um, you're storing that in a session, and that's still stored, stored in the database, so it's still uh, a potential uh, security implication. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, the, um, so there's a bunch of uh, um, 
Unfortunately, new, newer browsers, or fortunately, if you, or newer browsers will try to autocomplete form fields that you fill in, and that's not good for credit card information. Um, so uh, it's good to turn that off for your credit card fields. And each browser has different um, ways, different, different levels of support for disabling autofill. Uh, but with a few different types of syntaxes, you can pretty much disable it for a lot of things. And, I, and in this example, um, autocomplete off in the form and, and field and the inputs uh, will help disable that feature. And also, um, meta tags in the, the template head will disable uh, the caching, so, so it will be less of an issue. Um, finally, uh, the, uh, I like to have a, a refresh, a page refresh, so if someone leaves their computer, it will, um, uh, it will refresh the page. You know, if they have their um, credit card information on the screen and they walk away, it will refresh, refresh the page after um, a certain period of time. And in this case, uh, I just chose an arbitrary number, um, but you can customize this as you need. Uh, also, something that I think is a good idea is to uh, set a session expir expiration time um, you can either set it in the settings.py or in the checkout view, and basically um, uh, it will clear the session out if the user, or will, like um, clear out the cookies or if, you, um, if the user lets their session idle for a while. Now this obviously can, can be a problem if you have like, if you, if you want someone to just have stuff in your shopping cart persistently and come back to it later, so you'd have to engineer around that a little bit, like maybe by, uh, by somehow storing your, uh, the state of your, uh, uh, of your user's shopping cart, like with a user profile or something. But um, if you're just doing a simple e-commerce application and you want to um, uh, ensure that uh, users' data is not just uh, is not persistent, um, you might consider putting in a refresh like this. So um, each of these uh, different payment processors have. Um, different pros and cons. Uh, they're all in the business for a reason. Like, they all are, are still, they're fairly competitive with each other. And um, so it's kind of, it depends on what your client wants, what their situation is, um, to help you uh, choose, not only from a technical perspective, but uh, from a business perspective, uh, what types of needs they'll need, or they'll want, they'll want for their credit card processing. So um, at this point, I like to open it up for questions. Um. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my question is, um, <clears throat> do you mean the authorization should be done in the checkout view instead of the informs of PY? Um, I would like to hear more about why. Why is that the case? What about returning an error to the user? I like to have the authorization yeah, in the checkout view. And uh, is that your question is um, uh, what why, type of Why not in, in clean? And why, because we have to return an error to the user. So it seems that logic to me to do it in, in forms, in, in clean, because then you return an, an error uh, in the form. So you're saying no? I don't, I don't like putting it personally in the clean because, again, then it's, uh, it's sending a, a request um, outside, uh, sending an outside request when you validate the form. And, um, you know, clean, to me, f feels like you're just cleaning the, the form data and not, it, it should be, uh, um, you know, it shouldn't change the state of things. It should just clean, uh, clean the form data. And then after that, uh, you can uh, process your authorization. And if, if you want to, report errors to your user in the form, uh, that's what that little, uh, that I guess could be kind of like a hack, but it's uh, basically uh, appending uh, information to the error messages list uh, when I p process the payment so that uh, it'll still render the errors with the form. Mm, okay, thank you. Hi, so we're currently using PayPal standard IPN. Um, which has multi-currency support and uh, doesn't require us to be PCI compliant, which is awesome, but it has the most awful API. <laughs> so looking at the, the things that you've talked about, it looks like Stripe has a really awesome API and um, doesn't require any PCI compliance, 
but it doesn't support multi-currency stuff. But so my question is, um, when you say that it doesn't support multi-currency, if people are paying with like a Visa credit card, um, can they pay for something through Stripe even though it only accepts USD and then the conversion will be done in their credit card or can they just not pay with a credit card if they're in another country? I, I think that, uh, I, I have to look this up, but I, I believe Stripe supports multiple currencies, just not international payments, so you can still, um, uh, you can still make payments if you're in the U.S. with multiple currencies, but uh, that, does, that answer, that's a, does that answer your question? I think so. Thanks. Sure. Do you have a sense of what the data portability is like from all the various vaults? So if I'm at, say, Authorize, and then you know, later on I want to move to Stripe, um, and I have all my customer data stored with the, you know, whatever it's called, a SIM vault, um, will Authorize let me get it out? I know Braintree makes a point of that, but I'm wondering if you have a sense of what the other vendors are like. Sorry, I have the, there's an echo. I'm Sorry, the, the question basically is, if I have my customer data stored in the various vault services, so Authorize or Braintree or whatever, um, and I move to a different vendor, so I want to, you know, I'll rewrite the, the payment por portions of the app to work with Braintree instead, can I get my customer data out? Can I get the credit cards that are stored with Authorize? So uh, there's, yeah, that's, um, that's a big issue. Um, obviously, if you have a lot of customer credit cards stored and um, you want to switch providers, you're, you're kind of stuck. Um, but Braintree and I believe Stripe support this, uh, I forgot what it's called, like open credit card initiative or open card initiative. I, I can post that uh, initiative, but it, Braintree started this initiative to allow um, portability between credit card numbers and to find a process for doing that. And, and payment gateways obviously have to support that. I don't believe that PayPal or Authorize do support that, but there are a bunch that are, are uh, providing support for that. Um, so, Thanks. Yeah, sure. Hey, great talk. Um, so I have a question uh, about offering, basically collecting payments on behalf of other merchants. Um, so we're using Recurly, which is one of the ones that you didn't cover in your talk. Um, but I've heard that some of the other services like Stripe um, don't allow you to collect money and then hold it for a period of time before paying it out. And I know Chad from uh, GitTip had this problem. I'm just wondering if you ran across that or if, if you have any thoughts about which of these providers are, are most amenable to that type of just use case. Storing, storing data? Well, uh, basically, you know, like our, our service, we, we charge end users subscription fees and then we pay developers a percentage of that. And I've heard that some of the providers don't allow that. Um, most of these, the providers aren't storing the money. Stripe, in this case, is the only one that is. Um, and um, uh, most of the other services that mentioned, except for the pay flow payments, you're using the merchant account to store the money so it's not, um, uh, that's paid on a daily basis. As, as far as Stripe, um, I'm not sure what their policies are for you know, storing your money. I know they have a seven-day wait period, but that's uh, um, that's all I, about I know on that regard. But I can talk to you afterwards if you're interested. Right. PayPal has something called bulk payments, where you can pay people out just using their Yeah, if you use the the developer's own Stripe API key, then it's just passed through. Like the money just goes straight to them. But there's no way of yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joe.